You're mute, sir. <clears throat> yeah, like, sir. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to I Focus Online, Lecture 151 and Retina Session 3. The lecture is with Dr. Anamika Patel and who will be talking on history taking in the case of retina and clinical evaluation. I also thank the great retina minds who have taken out their uh, time for uh, the postgraduates to learn. I request Dr. Lalit sir to please introduce Dr. Anamika. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the entire CFS family, welcome to yet another episode of uh, iFocus, where uh, uh, Santosh has designed this program, the basic aim being to empower. So Santosh from the beginning wants to empower all the younger colleagues so that they are rich in knowledge all across and become very competent and complete ophthalmologists. So we had had a very nice two episodes where we learned about uh, uh, clinical anatomy as well as uh, you know physiology by stalwarts. And today we move on further. You see, it's a graded kind of approach. And today, very important thing which often neglected and often we say, okay, fellow has taken this history and uh, you know we became empowered. But uh, here we have Dr. Anamika Patel from uh, Vishaka Patna LVPI, who uh, has done residency from, uh, from uh, Mahatma Gandhi Mission Institute and a fellowship in retinal and UVA from uh, LVPI Vishaka Patna only and currently practicing there. So basic, uh, her basic talk will be centered around how to take history in a, in a retinal patient and how to clinically evaluate. So uh, over to you, Anamika. Our talk time should be around, say, 40, 45 minutes and rest 10, 15 minutes for discussion so that, uh, you see, we don't lose the focus. We plan to start in time and finish on dot on time. Welcome, Dr. Mehti. So, uh, Mehti, we're just, uh, you know, starting now only. So yeah. Dr. Anamika from LVPI Vishakapatnam will be telling about uh, uh, history taking and clinical exam in retina patient. And she will most likely finish her talk in around 40, 45 minutes. And after that, uh, we'll take questions from the audience. And as all, everybody knows that we have hot seat concept here, where uh, people uh, you know, are given preference to uh, question uh, the speaker as well as panelists can also contribute. So without uh, much ado, let's uh, hear Anamika uh, with this very important talk on uh, history taking. Over to you, Anamika. Thank you, Dr. So before, 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 before one line I wanted, I can't, <laughs> I can't omit. So all of us should, uh, you know, uh, congratulate Santosh Honavar. You see, Stanford University, one of the top ranking ophthalmologists, Santosh, makes us feel very proud. So I thought I will announce here, uh, you know, I know he is a very shy and, uh, you know, reserved kind of person. He will not. But I thought uh, I will definitely announce here. And uh, I had a small... Uh, uh, you know, this slide here. You see, Santosh, Santosh uh, you make all of us proud. And even amongst the list, he figures amongst the top. That is what made me feel very good. So I thought I will, uh, you know, I can't stop myself. Yes, and I'm over to you. Wow, Carry what on. a beautiful start to my talk. Congratulations, Dr. Hanavar. And thank you so much to give me for giving me the opportunity to hear speak in front of all of you big people here. So uh, let me just share my screen. Yes, uh, is this uh, visible to everyone? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, perfect. Okay, Rolika, thank you. So hello everyone, good evening. I'm Anamika and uh, today I'll be speaking something about history taking and clinical evaluation specifically to retina. Now, Though today I may be speaking something which is related to retina, but it is just not about retina because history taking, I think, is, is something which is the crux of any clinician. And I think everybody in this uh, in today's meeting would agree with me. So on that note, I'll start. So when Dr. SH gave me this topic, I was really into mind that uh, how am I going to do it? What I'm, what I'm going to be speaking? when and how I should be, be juggling up my slides and uh, why should I speak certain things which I feel is 
particularly important. So uh, let's just over the next, uh, Dr. Lalit, I'm not going to speak for a very long time. I can assure you on that. So I'll just, let's just quickly move on to uh, this part of our presentation. And I hope all the listeners today, by, by the end of this, my talk would have a certain confidence in uh, becoming something which I think all humans are lacking in today's time, which is being a good listener or being able to speak effectively. So I think the uh, youngsters here, I am sure they must have known this. It's, this is a great series which comes on Netflix and Amazon. It's about a good doctor. So everybody wants to be a good doctor, but I think uh, there are a few signs which when I was reading up that which, which told me that there are at least few things which should be there if you want to be a good doctor. First, you should not be afraid to admit the gaps that are there in your knowledge. Second, you should just not be book smart. You should be emotionally intelligent also. By the way, that guy was not emotionally intelligent, the good doctor one that I was telling about. You should be a good listener and observer. Something around which my today's talk is going to revolve. You should be rel relentless and you should have faith in your own judgment. So in the today's August company, I think everybody belongs to these signs. So it's just not about having all the signs. I think but the most important thing here is that you should be a good listener and you should be a good observer. That would make you from an ordinary clinician to an astute clinician. So the question is that, are you going to be a great doctor? Well, uh, I was trying to find a good answer for this and I just landed up and ended up only with Prof. William Mosler's that many years back, he, what he wrote and recently I was reading this book and again I came across this course that it's all about listening to your patient because your patient is telling you the diagnosis. And another very important thing which may, takes us from a good to a great physician is that a good physician is only going to treat the disease, but a great physician is going to treat the patient who has the disease. Now, now just for a moment, just reflect on this extremely important statement because this is something where the entire game lies when you are in the clinic. So what you should be striving for, obviously all of us should, should be at least wanting to be a great physician. We should be able to understand the full story of our patient. Based on that, we should be able to make a correct diagnosis. And henceforth, of course, based on the good diagnosis, we should be able to communicate with our patient about the treatment plan that fit best for the patient. So, so how do we start with this? So suppose you are in a clinic and let's just assume that you don't know anything about how to go about it. And today, let me just give you some tips how to go about it. First and foremost, express yourself, introduce yourself. Tell your patient that who you are, what your name is, and ask for their permission that if they can be examined by you. And the next very important question where the history taking actually begins is that you need to ask your patient that, how can I help you? What brings you today to the clinic? I think uh, when you do that, when you introduce yourself as a doctor and or as a caregiver, I would say, and the patient who is there in front of you, when you ask this question that, sir or ma'am, how can I help you? What brings you today to the clinic? I think that is the first barrier that we break as clinicians because this is the time this is what I'm touching upon, which is effective communication, where our patient also feel a little bit relaxed. They, 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 they can feel that we are empathetic enough. We are there. We have ears and we are there to hear them so that they can express what they want to say. So many people can tell many stories. Um, if, if you're thinking about it, that what, Anamika, what are you saying? If in a busy OPD, there are so many things that you know you have to cover up we cannot just spend the entire time with my patient. But I am telling you, simple tips and simple tricks like this, by introducing yourself, gaining the confidence of your patient, breaks the first barrier. So uh, 
when it comes to retina there are many things uh, you know to to be a great physician and in order to strike that fine balance with your patient in terms of the history taking what few things that comes to my mind is that first and foremost i think uh, i'm really lucky to be able to examine retina because eyes are really windows to the soul i think all of us as ophthalmologists are really lucky because there are things which we can pick up which no other person can because there are certain systemic diseases which first manifest in the eyes so i think that that again begins the the second base for us to build that next order of confidence and trust with our patient that when you see a certain thing you do pay attention to that and you do ask your patient that if you had a blood transfusion sometime back or uh, how is your uh, hemoglobin status have you seen that or for how long ma'am or sir you are diabetic very few simple questions all right so it's all about systemic associations when it comes to the history and uh, the few important thing especially in retina in retina clinic uh, today i i just touch very few important things which are seen by almost all of us you need not be in a in a very uh, great place where you see only difficult cases i'm not going to speak anything uncommon i'm going to speak things which are extremely common now for example diabetes all of us see uh, diabetic patients come uh, you know coming coming in our clinics and uh, they all are of different ages what is important here is that we should be able to know the duration of the diabetes so here the points that i have written here they may look very theoretical to you but the point that i am trying to make is important is extremely important to ask your patient that for how long you are diabetic for example and if it is just not about diabetes you should also be able to ask your patient that what other systemic comorbidities they are having for example It's, it's it's extremely important that when you examine, suppose your patient comes, you introduce yourself, you ask them the question why they have come, and suppose they say we have just come for a routine checkup, and when you examine the patient, you when you see certain things that are there and that makes you suspect that this patient may be diabetic. If you have not asked your patient that you are diabetic or not, you are hypertensive or not, you may not be able to pick up other details which are there. for example in the retina or or you will be able to miss out the communication so it is extremely important so to just not uh, concentrate on one disease because there are other systemic correlations as well so ask for the history of this lipidemia that if they have any cholesterol related issues or not and be mindful of using the simple terms like what i just said about speaking about the cholesterol and not asking do you have this lipidemia no i mean i don't know i am a simple man i don't know what this lipidemia is ask me that you know if if my cholesterol is okay or not am i taking anything for my cholesterol and many patients same thing applies to hypertension many patients will not know what is hypertension is so effective communication would be just to be extremely simple and ask as in the sir or ma'am how is your bp have you recently seen that or something related to kidney rather than asking if you have a nephropathy and when you are able to do that you are also trying to bridge the main issue with the other systemic comorbidity again it's just not about uh, speaking about the age uh, but you should be looking at the age of a certain disease as well because we know that if a patient who is diabetic for a certain amount of time after few years they tend to develop the retinopathy so is again as a doctor again it's very important to know the disease or the age of the disease of your patient as well then of course there are certain other things which would not just come right that were you hospitalized recently or did you had a surgical history or any drug or substance abuse but when you see something that should become the basis to ask a very polite leading question to your patient i'm saying why polite because i will be touching upon one case that i happen to see recently so uh, for example i'm showing you something extremely common which is 
uh, proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So here we can see this nice disc is there. Here the slight neovascularization is setting in. This beautiful flat shape, uh, you know, flat neovascularization is there. Here there you are know, multiple signs. You can see that patient has heart exudates and this. Suppose you treat your patient, and despite treating your, of your patient, you are uh, you are uh, still seeing the persistence of uh, diabetic macular edema, for example. So that is the time that you, you should be again asking yourself that what am I missing? So the reason, I'll just share a few very small pearls which uh, will just make the case for me that why do I feel that the importance of systemic comorbidity is extremely important because if your patient has hypertension, you kind of get an uh, impression and you can kind of get an uh, confidence that if they are able to control their hypertension, they would be able to decrease the risk of retinopathy progression by at least by 35%, by need of laser therapy by 35%, and the vision loss by 50%. That is why it is extremely important to just not look at one disease and you have to look at the other disease. And for that, you have to ask, because patient may say, doctor didn't ask me, I never knew I, that I had to tell that answer, which is something which I think all of us experience. Another important part is when I was speaking about that, uh, asking the patient that how is their uh, cholesterol status. Now, uh, the, if the patient's cholesterol is, uh, is stable or if we are able to control the dyslip dyslipidemic status of your patient, we know that it reduces the risk of progression of the retinopathy as well as reduces the need for the laser treatment and has its own effect in terms of diabetic macular edema progression and stuff. All this is a theoretical knowledge, but what comes as a practical knowledge is knowing at that period, that period of time is that my patient is having other issues as well or not. And at the same time, you should be able to address those issues. So I think that is very important. Same thing up here um, applies to uh, when you want to know about the renal function of your patients. So of course, any patient of, a, for example, of a diabetic, uh, of a diabetes, when they come to your clinic and if they happen to have a diabetic retinopathy, I think uh, by norm, I am sure every, every one of us, we uh, screen the entire systemic status of the patient which starts from, the, from their uh, fasting and their post prandial and their uh, other associated risk factors. So here the associated risk factors comes when it comes to the renal function that if they have an associated renal issue, that would lead to the poorer or the future worsening of their microvascular environment. So that's why it is extremely important to know and to treat the, uh, the, the poor uh, renal function for your patient. And suppose, for example, if your patient has this persistent neovascularization, which despite of the treatment is, is not going, there is another very important thing is that we often miss in the clinic is uh, not knowing the, uh, the nutritional status of the patient. Because uh, many a times we may see a female who in India, I'm sure, or this, it's a known thing that the hemoglobin is, is a little lesser in, in females in compared to the males. And that also becomes one of the another risk factor in such patients who have the vascular uh, abnormalities. I, when I was taught this pearl, I think uh, the entire crux about the radiation-related retinopathy and a diabetic retinopathy, everything relied only on the disease, uh, on, on the history. Because <clears throat> you may teach somebody that you have to look for these dilated telangiectatic channels and the macula and, you know, in a radiation retinopathy, you will not see microaneurysm, you will not see venous bleeding and you will not see the proliferative changes, so and so. But the most important thing is that if you happen to miss the just the most important history taking in your patient, the entire game plan changes. Because if you know the history of your patient who, who tells you that, doctor, I had so and so, and then I had you know taken treatment for, uh, for this particular disease, and then I received this radiation for this amount of time, that gives you an understanding that what you are dealing with and that helps you miss the diagnosis. Another uh, very important thing which we, we can miss in our clinic is 
asking the drug histories uh, to our patient. Now, uh, it can be any drug, I mean, for, the, for that matter. For example, initially, uh, patients who used to take metformin, and still people do, these patients tend to have slight discolor. Now, that happens because of that. But it's important to be mindful of the fact that your patient is on that drug. I'll just cite another example of a careful uh, drug history is that uh, this patient landed up with a presentation of this uh, hypopion uh, like presentation in the in the left eye. This was a 41 year old male. And uh, here we saw the hypopion. So instead, uh, instead of us uh, going behind the hypopion, that what must have caused it, everything was, you know, it became so stable and so, so smoother only by knowing that this was a known case of a CML uh, and this patient was on imatinib and the hypopion that we were seeing, it was because of the, it was indeed a drug induced uh, hypopion. Another uh, example that I would like to share with everyone is that now uh, it can be an anterior or it can be a posterior segment presentation. Uh, don't mind uh, me just sharing only the anterior segment features here. So in retina you, uh, or in urea practice, you may see uh, any patient who have this recurrent uh, non granulomatous anterioritis. Or suppose if you do, do a fluorescent angiography, you may see uh, a ferning. Ferning is nothing but a pattern which, sim which is similar to a fern like thing and which is uh, seen in the, in the fluorescent angiography. So here, if you have a history, uh, associated history of your patient who admits that they have this recurrent oral and genital ulcers. Remember what Osler, uh, what Osler's quote I was quoting, it takes us directly that we may be dealing with possibly Bechet's or possibly syphilis. That is why it is extremely important to have that connect, to have that communication with your patients. It's fine if you do not ask your things at a certain time, but if you're looking at certain things, again, you should be asking for, for other things, which helps you um, complete the entire circle of making and having an effective uh, communication with your patient and taking the history and then able to, uh, you know, come to a certain differential diagnosis. Now, uh, this patient was, uh, was seen by by many physicians and uh, was was not on treatment for tuberculosis. But one very important thing that led to that was that he had this he had just this that doctor every evening or every alternate evening I feel that you know I, I feel it feverish. <clears throat> this this was what the patient complained was that they, that she had this uh, evening rising temperature and and then associated loss and cuff, I think that will just skip the flu. But uh, giving importance to a, to a case uh, or to a statement like this is again extremely important, which helps you come to a diagnosis that probably you are dealing with a tuberculosis. Now, uh, I'll tell you something uh, very uh, different about this case that this patient came in the emergency and uh, this patient was is he is a 65 year old male who, who came to the emergency services for the complaints of a uh, slight blood lesion in his left eye. At the time of presentation, he was really 31.6, but on examination, it looked like this. Now, uh, here, the why the history taking is important is that you ask your patient, you, you think that it is seeing the retinitis, and uh, but your patient tells you no, that you know, and you ask for the history of associate like if, if they are on any uh, you know um, drugs for the HIV but if the patient does not have HIV and if you still have a presentation like this then what you need to know is that are there other causes of the immunosuppression that must have led to a situation like this so here <clears throat> interestingly this patient was post renal transplant who was on on immunosuppression for last three four years and then developed a picture like this so uh before you uh, embarrass yourself, because why am I saying this is that just uh, looking at a picture like this, where you think that it's a CMV retinitis, if your patient comes and admits right in front of you, you know, that uh, yes, I am on you know, uh, anti -ret uh, retroviral drugs, then it's, it's, it's a different thing. But you may come across a patient because today's time is changing, it's not like those old times where 
people do not mind you asking questions. So if by looking at this, if you are so sure about yourself that oh, this is a CMB red titles, let me ask this question that uh, do you have AIDS? It 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 may come and really bite you in the back. So uh, there is a way of asking question and there, you should be mindful of the fact that there could be other uh, risk factors or other associations as well that may cause a similar presentation to what we are seeing here. Now, uh, asking something subtle while taking the, uh, the history is, uh, is very important. Why? Because uh, I, I had this uh, experience when I happened to see this patient. She was uh, a young female. I saw her like, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, around three years back during my fellowship. And she had come with the complaints of this slight blurring of vision. And you see this uh, nice whitening is seen and this, uh, you know, the vascular tortuosity, vessel tortuosity is there. It's only in the superior half of it now, in the half the spine. And if you look in the OCT, you can say, uh, see this nice uh, inner retina, and you can see this prominent limiting membrane here, and the hyperreflective activity is seen here. So, a picture like this, where I, I was sure that I'm looking at a PAM. Though um, the patient was 18 year old, and uh, the patient turned out to be a risk factor for the homocysteinemia. The another thing which was kind of subtle and was was later on revealed to us was that that she was a constant substance abuser which a patient used to inhale some kind of acetone or something which uh, which actually led to a condition like this another example is uh, <clears throat> about seeing uh, a picture like this like uh, this very frank central retinal vein occlusion if you happen to see in male in a, in a young patient which could be a bilateral or a unilateral presentation where uh, there are signs like this which are just screaming that there is something wrong in the body so you have to ask your patient that if they have any underlying other disorders or not this this patient who we we got to see was was a was on treatment for uh, for his leukemia. So I was I spoke about that uh, substance abuse uh, uh, case when I showed you all the the lesion in the right eye, which was spam in that young girl. Now uh, there is this another case of another young person again who just said that I'm not able to see for last you know two days. You do everything and you are not able to come to anything come to conclusion to anything. And the only thing that, uh, that finally, uh, you know, you have, you, patient is young and you have to ask that, you know, what, what was your entire day like yesterday? And when the patient admits that he had bought this uh, nice, uh, what do we say, that pointer, and he was trying to point at everything and accidentally he looked at it. So this photographically happened because of that laser. So uh, this is why it is extremely important sometimes to revise the statements that you make when you are taking the history specific, specifically in today's times when we are dealing with the youngsters, I would say. I spoke about youngsters. Let me tell you about uh, the story of this uh, old guy who I saw last year. So uh, he was one of the last patients of that day evening and he comes with this uh, complaint of that doctor, I'm not able to see. And I see him and I see this nice red nitus. So if you go by the classic uh, teaching that if you see a unifocal necrotizing red nitus at, uh, you know, at a posterior pole, you should suspect toxoplasmosis. So that's what I did. But I, I had seen a small speck of hemorrhage, but I was like, this is something, uh, something is not fitting. And... Uh, I know I tried the, I started the patient on treatment, but I called him back the another day. The very next day, patient had a very slight hypopion. I was like, now this does not fit. Why would a patient of a toxin is going to develop a hypopion the next day when I have started the treatment? I, I again asked the patient that, sir, you had any, uh, any history of having, you know, were you, were, did you suffer from anything in the last six months? Or were you admitted or have you taken any treatment of any sorts in the last six months? Because as for the patient, he was absolutely okay. 
by my continuous probing on the second day patient finally admitted that he was indeed a case of a covid and uh, covid 19 and he had received medication he said i was not admitted madam i was only in my house but i received the medications so then obviously i revised my diagnosis and i came to a conclusion that what i was dealing was was not a toxo or retinoceratitis it was actually a corio retinitis with the uh, which was a covid endogenous endophthalmitis so uh, this is how sometimes we have to go back and ask certain questions even and and probe our patients if they are not coming up with it so uh, i think i made my case when i wanted to speak about uh, history taking that first you have to introduce yourself make your patient comfortable that you are you are not you are not somebody who does not care patient should feel that you know you, my doctor cares for me and is ready to listen to my issues and i think everybody would agree that our patients uh, once you have that good patient doctor relationship right at that moment if you are able to strike that chord the patient is really not going to uh, irritate you in any way and will give you just the good pointers that the reason why they are here what really irritates them and why do they feel that why do they feel in that certain manner so uh, based on that uh there was there were few uh quotes that we heard about uh oslo and uh, how we can move from being a good to a great physician so if you ask me about a clinical evaluation i know this topic is going to be taken in detail in the next lecture so i have not made something extremely elaborative but what i would tell you is that uh, looking everything in a, in in a very magnified manner as you can see here basically looking into the detail is the key to everything because a good astute clinician does not only really listens to the patient he is also a great observer and by great observer i mean that you may see this case and say that okay fine anamika this is a straight forward pdr case and i i see few vessels are attenuated fine what is there but if you are just very confident about it just just look at the neighbor here the disc because disc is not that great so it's extremely important that when you are looking into the retina you should be looking in in each and every part of retina that is there in the retina so if a disc is there you have to look at the disc and you cannot just discount it that okay fine i'm looking at a retina no if if you are holding only a 90 uh, 90d lens i i then i don't feel that we are really looking into the retina because we have to examine the entire retina till the periphery till then you are not doing justice to your patient when they have come for a retina evaluation another important part is that i was telling about the structures e anything and everything that you see in the retina you have to look carefully because there are times when you may see a little glistening reflex and you may think that it is nothing but actually it's an early uh, you know a uh, uh, early stage of a epiretinal membrane that is becoming so that is another important thing so i spoke about looking into details of everything that is there in the retina i'll just give one tip that uh, if you if you do not have uh, Uh, a good fundus camera suppose for example if some day your your patient is moving head a lot and you are not able to uh, you know take a fundus photograph for your patient where while evaluating the patient what may come handy is when you switch on the red free filters for your patient because red free filter is something which is extremely good especially in the vascular cases reason why i i chose this pearl was because uh, diabetic retinopathy is something which everybody sees so it really helps you to not only image but it also helps you to grade the diabetic retinopathy as you can see here there are multiple things that can be seen very clearly which may go missed if uh, if you know if we have not used the red free filter so the mantra is that it's not a complete examination till you have seen the periphery you cannot miss the disc there are shades of yellow and red in retina and you should be able to understand which shade of yellow you are looking at so for example today you may have a patient uh, who has recently bled 
and has a subhaloid hemorrhage, which obviously will look red because it is fresh. And it should not happen that after a while, when the same uh, when the same bleed starts getting dehemoglobinized, it turns starts turning into yellowish white, and you think that oh my god, is that a retinitis? That should not happen because you are looking at the shades of yellow and red, and you should never discount the general appearance of the patient. Now, this is extremely important. Why do I say that? Because at times you are going to look at your patient. You'll just come on your fine, yeah, what you have, and you just examine the retina and you go off. No, just for a moment. As you open the door of your, your clinic, your patient is sitting right in front of you. Or sometimes when you are waiting for your patient and the moment they are coming, walking, and then they take uh, the seat, you can, you can, there are multiple things to, you know, to really observe in your patient. Let's say the general appearance of the patient, their gait, for example. Sometimes you may see your patient limping. Sometimes you may see your patient is the, his peripheral vision is not that great because they would be, you know, abutting a few things which the patient may not realize, but you would realize. And something uh, extremely common which I do in all of my diabetic patients is that often you will see that you know they are having either some bandage or you know or something like that. So those those are the patients of of your diabetic patients who are having a diabetic foot which is again, which gives you an understanding that the diabetic, uh, the, the blood sugar levels is really not that great. And uh, that again is extremely important for us because suppose if you want to take up the patient, for example, uh, vitro retina surgery and with that diabetic foot, then I think you need to have consult with the physician who is treating the patient. So this is what I'm telling that you should never discount the general appearance of the patient. The last thing that I would speak on the appearance of the patient is that if they look malnourished or if their weight is extremely poor to, you know, to begin with, you, you have to suspect certain things uh, based on the appearance as well. So it's not a medicine bedside clinic that I'm taking to, uh, this evening. I'm just telling that you have to look in general the entire appearance of your patient. How are they? Are they healthy or not? Are they able to walk properly or not? Do they have anything like, for example, I was speaking of the diabetic foot. Or, for example, when you have a patient who has a leukemia, and uh, sometimes they may not say, but their appearance will tell you that. So those are a few things which would uh, give you clues. So I hope by, by this evening, uh, to whatever uh, I have spoken, I have given uh, the residents this evening some confidence to become uh, a good listener, to be able to speak effectively, and I hope they transcend from the good doctor to the great physicians because let's just revise this quote again that the good physician treats the disease, but the great physician treats the patient who has the disease. Thank you everyone for the patient listening. Thank you Anamika for uh, this talk. And uh, you see, you not only highlighted about the retina, but uh, general points because history taking is a non-ending kind of subject and evaluation also. Uh, let's open it for discussion and we will keep pointing out sub points here and there. But I was listening to all your nine, nine examples which you showed uh, precisely uh, about uh, starting from diabetic and ending up with endogenous endophthalmitis the cases, and it was more like a storytelling of uh, nine or 10 cases, rather than you see specific, uh, like you rightly said in the beginning, the aim of the talk is somehow to, uh, you know, be a good listener and observer and uh, listen to your patient very, very well. Because often what a clinician does or a senior people with gray hairs like me will directly start examining and come to a diagnosis. Often you may be right, but sometimes, uh, you know, the, the surprises are thrown. And that is where uh, seniors are taught, are caught, and, you know, somebody junior will take one history and tell that this patient had had history. So I'm reminded of one patient, if Dinesh may also remember, both of us had operated this young lady from a villager in Apollo Hospital a couple of years back. This lady still keeps coming. Right eye, this lady had thysis bulbi. Left eye, she had a secondary RD, leg RD. 
Why secondly? Because there was evidence of uh, multiple hemorrhages and, and there was evidence of vascular attenuation there. So the reason I remember this lady is because a couple of uh, months back only I saw her and she comes from a very poor class family and a villager far away from Hansi. Uh, I don't know Dinesh because I am following this lady for a long, long time. And uh, we couldn't figure out what is going on in this patient. We did operate. This lady has today 6 by 9 vision. Very good, uh, you know, recovery. But you see, the cause we could not. Ultimately, ultimately, one of our colleagues only pointed out that husband was, uh, you know, HIV positive. And he had somehow transmitted that disease to the entire family, including the kids. So then she cried and opened out that what she has. So what I, what you also rightly pointed out, you have to enter into a dialogue. Somehow she was not forthcoming in that history of telling about her husband that she had had, you know, uh, activities beyond her married life also. And we also never suspected because young lady coming from a villager, 20, 22 year old lady. So then when I was listening to your talk, I was reminded of a couple of examples, which we also have faced. So very rightly, you said, you see, enter into a dialogue with the patient. And then, uh, you know, uh, all of us will have some examples to tell you where you have been helped by good history taking. So, uh, Ajit, uh, any other point you want to make? Or Dr. Mehti? We'll unmute. Yeah. Uh, the whole presentation, what uh, I was observing is we are giving a classic examples and say this how we explore and all, but clinic is not like that. The patient enters with a, a typical presentation and then throws a challenge for the clinician. Uh, we need to have both uh, listening, definitely it is required, but uh, open mind in exploring what are the findings, clinical findings the patient is giving, how atypical they are, and uh, then uh, explore at each uh, level differential diagnosis. That will help you in exploring different directions so that ultimately you will get into the final diagnosis. You see, Anomika, the process begins right at the way the patient is coming to your clinic. Yes. Age, age, sex, pata lag jata. You see, patient is young, old. So, the mark may tend to be true. Other way, young patient may causes of diminished vision, kya honge, kya hoge. And, uh, and age, pata lag gaya, sex, pata lag gaya. And if, if he or she is walking alone, koi help aari hai, nahi aari hai. Or help aari is going to bilateral loss of vision hai. You start thinking something differently. And like you said, if you wheelchair, pe hai, diabetic foot, hai, whatever. So that observation, initial, that even 30 seconds of your astute observation is good enough to have your thought process ringing up, what all may be going on. That is very, very significant. And you did point in all your uh, nine cases of study taking. And the other thing which I agree, she ultimately, how I tell approach my patient is, you see, I definitely will ask what brought you here. Aap kyon yahan pe that like you rightly said. And then... Three things are very important for me. Eye ke baare mein, body ke baare mein, and uh, any treatment history ke baare mein. These three things I will definitely ask. Rest of the history maybe. You see, other is a dynamic process also. Sometimes you may get rewarded after you have done the indirect, then you retrospectively, when I'm doing indirect, I will be, you know, become wiser. Aapko blood pressure, aapko, you know, autoimmune, whatever disease, koi physician ko kabhi dikhaya. So this dialogue keeps happening during indirect, after indirect, when I'm writing notes, when I'm referring the patient for angiography, OCT, laser. So this dialogue keeps happening. And it's not a one point process or one time process. It keeps happening. And you become wiser because of this process. Another yes, thing uh, which uh, I emphasize is that we should list, ask the patient, what is your problem? Yeah. Most yeah, often yeah. Uh, our assistants must have written something and uh, we may get on to the but always right. ask the patient why you have come first. Yeah, she highlighted very nice. Very, what very brought, essential. What, what brought you here? So three things should not be forgotten. Eye ke point of view say, body ke point of view say, and treatment history point of view. Yes, yes. So Mehti, you were making one point? Yeah, uh, actually, uh, it was good. Dr. Anamaka pointed out this diabetic foot. It happened today only. Uh, we are uh, most focused to the diabetic retinopathy find findings. Uh, it happened last week. There was a TRD. I posted the case. Today, when I uh, 
play uh, actually the keys okay. was there in the ot i <laughs> discovered that he had a diabetic foot not a very frank one but i had to cancel the case so this is so important we are sometimes very focused to eye only and yeah. we don't take the history the systemic history or other general ailment and uh, another point i want to uh, focus like uh, sometimes the symptoms are so important like in a in a patient of an epiretinal membrane uh, unless and until the patient is symptomatic it is i think it is better not to touch that eye because absolutely. we cannot make that patient happy absolutely so the symptoms see, where the symptoms of distortion of vision is there absolutely you see the the other thing from retina point of view anamika which needs to be highlighted is suddenness suddenness of anything happening mil may tail towards the retina as the pathology or optic nerve as the pathology suddenness suddenness in metamorphopsia suddenness of blurred vision suddenness of micropsia suddenness of anything so if you have a sudden nazar come hui hai ya achanak teda mera dikha hai ya achanak kuch bhi hua hai so then you think differently no dinesh yeah so i think it's a very important uh, i think all this that you're telling is very important there are two aspects one is keeping did you make your patient satisfied and the second is did you get satisfied making the patient satisfied is completely different from making a diagnosis and being satisfied and what i think what lalit pointed out very often we just get down to examination and because it takes me 30 seconds to figure out what's going on but the patient wants to talk and that's what i think you people are highlighting that give him time to talk two things happen from that one he tells you what his problem is for example you see an epiretinal membrane his problem was actually watering they're not related <laughs> you can treat you you will end up doing the surgery and have him have more watering and he'll come and curse you so be careful what is the patient's problem as babu said very critical then see whether you're going to manage the second important thing create the story you see when you when you see any patient wherever he is today he has no vision you must have a story for it how did this happen starting from the beginning how has he been here you should be able to explain everything if you can't explain there's something wrong go back you need more questions so when do you need questioning when you can't explain the story so this is the second important thing these are general things but i'll give you some certain blunderbuss points which i do in my practice any patient who comes when i start examining when i start talking to him before i write any investigation fluorescein angiography icg i need to know do you have not only diabetes which is ob- obvious hypertension heart disease bronchial asthma kidney disease liver disease any drug allergies now you will note what do these cover they make sure is there any contraindication to a fluorescein angiography is there any contraindication to an icg is there any reason for me to be careful about the anti vegf treatments which are often going to be what i'm going to be giving all these points need to be made part of your routine workup uh, in your history because otherwise you will miss them so this is one i mean I, this is something which i actually write down point wise in every prescription so it is very important that at least negative 5 6 history is what dinesh has pointed out should also be elicited because this helps you like he was saying jitna bhi investigation humne tailor karna hai ya anti vegf dene hai at least you become wiser within you see i have seen his record dinesh writing no history of bronchial asthma no history of drug like no no history me panch chart line likhni zaruri instead of eliciting positive history negative history adds to the value of your uh, it- investigations If it's positive it needs to be tailored accordingly yeah. the second important thing and this is as regards examination and i see this routinely there seems to be a complete lack of remembering of the fact that angle closure glaucoma is an entity precipitated by dilatation before you go ahead and ask the patient to be dilated you must note that the anterior chamber is normal the angle is normal only then the dilation must be done otherwise you're going to one day end up in a one patient is enough to destroy your career where you lose an eye because of an angle closure glaucoma you see very important point very important because all of us uh, all of us project ourselves to be top at now this thing this thing we direct karne ke baad hi dekhenge or whatever and uh, sometimes ignore 
but wherever you see this point is of very very importance once you are doing history evaluating a retina patient you see history taking to anamika alag ho gaya once you are evaluating because retina examination is incomplete without dilatation you can't evaluate properly so dilate hare ko karna hi karna hai so before you dilate ask someone if if you are so busy or whatever something should be noted somewhere that ac normal depth or whatever at least by you know flashlight or slit lamp preferably but ac normal hai. so that at least like you say we do not want ourselves to be in a soup that patient lands up in acg and for retina to fir side track ho gaya we are giving manitol wo sara ko shuru ho gaya the third so point, very very important good good points coming up in one uh, one thing i'd like to talk about the, one of the common features that we have is um, floaters and scotomas now both will present with black spots differentiating a scotoma from a floater is very important a floater moves independently a scotoma is going to move maintain the same relationship with the visual axis but there is another pair part of a scotoma there is what is known as a scotoma because of a neurological problem patient gets says he has a, a black spot actually what he is having is a black spot coming at recurrent intervals those are actually not they are not scotomas they are actually um, uh, these this is a form of an occipital uh, lobe or a visual pathway um, uh, seizure these patients are are actually they are alert there is no there is no loss of consciousness it's a focal seizure and every year i pick up at least one or two patients like this so in these patients in these patients all examination will be normal you see you will not uh, so, you see this different between floater floaters scotoma and uh, this sensation visual sensation which come very important patient will say i saw a, th- there is either he'll say flash comes goes comes goes it's a regular periodic flash which comes goes comes goes or it's like a small spot which is a dark spot which is there for some time it goes away comes for some time then goes away that is these are yeah, signs yeah. of a visual pathway uh, seizure and you if you ask them sometimes they'll even give you a history of a post ictal mild headache so whenever you have this kind of history you must ask for a neurology check up rolika anybody if in the in the hot seat uh, you have any questions uh, we have ask, you before i ask mm-hmm. you must to make some comments No, uh, we have few questions, sir. So yeah. the first take question up, take is that because those the, are important. Sorry, yeah. sir. Yeah, yeah. Please, those yeah, are important for us. Okay, okay. So in the short duration that uh, uh, the postgraduates have, right before the 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 case presentation in the final exam, uh, in that short duration, what are the uh, uh, you know clinical feature? The what are the elements in the history that they should not miss? or they should ask but what should they keep in mind like the minimal that should not be missed in our retina case so that's what i started with you see when server you know like uh, anamika said very nicely what is the what is your chief complaint in you know in rp center we used to have the red file chief complaint is a must there's some things you have to ask irrespective of uh, any any whether retina or any case then for from retina point of view a uh, lot of things once patient depending on the chief complaint suppose patient has complained of decreased vision then you go into depth of that unilateral bilateral suddenness how much decreased vision whether it's a complaint by you know floaters or or metamorphopsia or field defect or so many other things so as, as i said for me suddenness is very important which will tell you that ye retina ka issue ho sakta hai and flu- and suddenness this decrease in the center that is scotoma most likely maybe a macular pathology peripheral view is clear so that if there is a if there is a you know shadow coming from somewhere you start suspecting it may be a case of regardi if the how is how is the progress there you see how were yesterday how you are today so retina patient of detachment especially speed regardi will progress very very fast kal tak vision theek thi aaj khatam ho gayi then vascular diseases like arterial block will have sudden absolute sudden within seconds minutes that patient has loss of vision so those points have to be added in detail chinivas chinivas yes sir yes sir yes hello <laughs> yeah where are you we are listening we are listening oh, uh, one second
i think anamika you did a wonderful job uh, uh, the one thing which i liked in one of her programs which was conducted along with uh, dr avinash patange is different types of thinking which they analyzed it yeah yeah i know i know uh, i don't know if uh, anamika yeah, yeah. Uh, have stressed it a little bit like about the concrete thinking abstract thinking analytical mm-hmm. thinking divergent convergent creative kind of thinking i think these are very important uh, to come to a diagnosis as a whole so nowadays what is happening is uh, in the vitro retina department our fellows are seeing only retina whether they are having cataract also they are not much bothered about it they are they are more focusing and even if a small fleck is there they try to pick it up very fast so uh, i think uh, the history taking is a, is a very very important uh, on that part and it's a very basic part which not uh, many of us uh, many of the teachers now cover it in the modern day kind of teaching with the so much of modern gadgets so, we have so in nowadays. in this in this particular so focus program shrinivas uh, equipment, equipment we are having nowadays so what i was saying was in this particular i focus program let us concentrate and make the audience wiser by saying from retina point of view as rolika was asking or if uh, uh, madam christie has joined in case she has some question there so let let's try to answer their questions yeah any question question so uh, another question is there that since uh, the dnb exams are held in different uh, different places so there are uh, a lot of a uh, lot of students face language barriers when they go for their examination and uh, how do you suggest that they should go about taking history in order to create a good rapport with the patient uh, without really uh, having that language barrier as a concern so my take on this is you can always have a translator because otherwise it will be very difficult you may actually flounder there because suppose i am in tamil nadu and i can't converse or either sign language or you know draw something and ask and patient may not uh, respond instead of you suffering you can say there is a language issue and you can always ask for help no harm no yeah. harm in asking the presence of translator is very very essential especially in frcs we always ask clinicals we ask whether candidate requires any translator that is very essential and you should not ever compromise during the exam because uh, only because of that candidates may fail and other thing anamika you stressed in the in the end about the clinical evaluation was red free image very i was very impressed with that yeah. and very important is you see indirect ophthalmoscopy is the is the key for retina examination you see i may i may forgive somebody for slit lamp or this thing although not but indirect for retina is a must uh, with depression and periphery no, because that is very very i think uh, at a blanket statement everyone should be conversant with indirect ophthalmoscopy every ophthalmologist those are gone are those days where they have uh, managed with uh, direct ophthalmoscope but now nowadays indirect ophthalmoscope is a must and this was a constant debate with other specialties uh, throughout my career actually that after um, covid it has become obsolete <laughs> yeah <laughs> but but yeah, but methi the question is is the focus of this particular talk and series i focus with santosh as nicely designed is that how to prepare a post graduate for this thing so uh, anamika said very nicely if, even if you have not done it please mention i have not done because you see for me if a patient comes with flashes floaters and uh, for not my mistake but patient says is not willing to get dilated or mid dilated i will write down in that some scope not done so that kalko you know shrima joshi picks up some break and he can't uh, tell me that uh, you know you have not so at least write down documentation also you see uh, namika is very very important whatsoever you have done please write it there and that notes he should definitely dr sohini was telling some question uh, namika reasons yeah. for tessellation in a, in a fundus with no myopia comments namika he says patient yeah, in so, non myo there is a tessellated fundus so it could be sometimes when uh, it could be a retinal dystrophy as well for example that would be a very rare thing where you just see a very prominence of all the choroidal vessel or sometimes when the retinal pigment epithelium is kind of washed off that's the time when you see the attenuated choroidal vessel when they just start sliding up so that could be another uh, that could be another case where you see such presentation uh, dinesh want to elaborate on this 
No, I think I think the commonest situation would be when there is actually no cause and it's it's just a variant. You see, tessellation by word, you should know. Tessellation means there is an RP atrophy, an easy visibility of the coral. That is what is related. There could be a general this thing. It, you, I don't think you're going to. Uh, the the uh, mild level of tessellation is not something you will always be able to find a cause for. All the conditions we are talking about are. Are uncommon conditions. If you start running after them in every case, you will end up leaving the cases which actually have a problem. So, Rolika, any other no, questions you uh, have? Or I, just, I just want to point out here that the pseudo fake case, it's almost uh, the, every uh, the power is totally neutralized unless we ask whether they have used a myopic glasses before. These cases can have a neutral power at the same time they can have a myopic tessellation. This one need to keep it in mind. So actually, uh, you know, I agree. All these things, whatever you're talking, can go on and on. These are non-ending subjects. Everybody will have some stories you tell. But Raulika had a most tough time because how to tell history taking because uh, at, at a consultant level, very difficult to tell. But in a nutshell, I think she gave examples which are which leave a lasting imprint rather than telling uh, ABC theory two three points. But nine examples of her at least have left some imprint in my mind that endogenous dikhaya, CRV and young dikhaya, and fern petal leakage dikhaya, then you know that uh, CMV retinitis dikhaya. So these do leave an imprint. You, you see, teaching is an ongoing process. It continues. Even we are learning today also. Everybody keeps learning. So today at least we learned about history, evaluation. And uh, I stressed about points like anything sudden happening should point towards retina cases. And uh, Rolika very nicely said, uh, you know, importance of slit lamp, 90-day examination, indirect, preferably with depression. And evaluation, may, there are a lot of imaging modalities which Srinivas was telling. And you see, sometimes you go retro also. Srinivas, uh, after you have, suppose, uh, you know, you have seen imaging, then you go back and ask uh, retro. No, Srinivas? History. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, very true. I just wanted to to make one I can't point hear sir, you. when uh, all of you gave yeah you are not able to hear me yeah come yes, carry on carry on carry on yeah so yeah. Uh, in terms of erg as well sometimes we get the erg and in the yeah. extinguished cases and uh, it is very difficult to distinguish between what kind of dystrophy it is whether it's a rod cone dystrophy cone rod dystrophy or whether it was an lca or oh. whether it could be any other uh, so I think in any in ERG also, I just want to make one more point. ERG also, it's very important uh, because in the school level, the, the, the cones take up the, the prominence and we have the cone dystrophy more than the rod dystrophy. But however, when it comes to the second or the third decade, then it usually combines together. So Absolutely. Absolutely. In, 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 in any case of pigmentary retinopathies, I think history taking is also a very important point uh, other than all the diseases which have been covered by uh, Anamika and all of you all. Absolutely. I agree. You see, this is an ongoing thing. So I'll just summarize by saying history taking is an entering into a dialogue which uh, Anamika said and the difference between good clinician and great clinician he, she emphasized. And, and apart from the uh, you know other points which she had highlighted, slit lamp examination, 90D examination, Indirect examination, red field photography, a lot of imaging modalities which she was saying, and not to forget electrophysiology. The reason, obviously, Anamika didn't cover because each of them will form a part of the module. And she said in the evaluation because next we have you know a fundus examination, imaging, electrophysiology, they will get covered. But suffice to say, all these five or six things ultimately narrow it down to your working diagnosis and treatment, and uh, ultimately make you a great clinician from a good clinician. So I think we will, this uh, with this, we'll thank Anamika, Santosh, Rolika, and uh, Dinesh, Ajit, Methi for all their contributions and Joshi for highlighting. And we will wait for the next Retina module by Santosh Hanover and CFS team. Thank Santosh. you so much, sir. Thank you so much for Anamika, ma'am. Thank you for the wonderful lecture. And thank you, everyone, for sparing out your time. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Santosh, any... No, the next module is on uh, Friday, and that will be on indirect ophthalmoscopy and fundus drawing by Ritesh Narula. Yeah. So thank you, everybody.
we need to respect time and uh, yes. therefore call it a day thank you thank, thank you everybody thank bye you. bye good night see you good night